and welcome back to Fool Me Once, the show that reminds you that although history does not repeat itself, it often rhymes. Last time we spoke about how the digital imperialists get us to play along. These modern day imperialists do this by putting something truly remarkable in front of us and conditioning us to use it every day, to think about it 24 seven. And this, our near constant use, is how they get our data, and lots of it. Today, we will learn about why they, tech companies like Meta, Google, Jumia, why they get our data. And the reason why they get to use our data is so simple. The digital imperialists get to use our data because we allow them. We give them our permission, and we give them our permission because it is easier than living in a world without the services they provide. I mean, admit it. The internet is extraordinary. The ability to access whatever you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, is nothing short of god life. We literally speak and it appears. Can you imagine trying to do work 30 years ago, having to physically walk to a library, pull out some books, read through the books, copy out the notes by hand, return the books and repeat. Now all of that happens at the touch of a literal button. Imagine trying to remember important birthdays, anniversaries, meetings, dinners, appointments without your phone or calendar. The price of this convenience is our data. When we agree to the imperialists using our data, the agreements or contracts we sign operate on this principle. We want convenience and we will give up our data to get it. But understand that when we sign on the dotted line, far more is going on than you might be aware. And in order to understand this, we need to go back to the beginning. We need to return to the beginning in order to see how the promise of the internet was undercut by the reality of contract. Today, we will chart how the internet came to be colonized. In the beginning, there was data and it was everywhere. However, it was without form and useless. Like crude oil in the early 19th century, there was no vehicle to make it valuable, no machine to make it precious, and no company willing to exploit it. So data remained everywhere, in every corner, on every page, on every computer. And what's more, it just kept growing and growing. A resource whose limitation, whose only limitation, was our imagination, whose specific capabilities were our capacities. But it lacked structure. Like an open faucet, it kept pouring out of every facet of the internet. What was once a trickle is now a gushing river, a gushing river without a dam, or a resource-rich country without a border. This was the situation 30 years ago, when the internet was new and shiny. With the potential to make accessible and available all the information, knowledge and culture in a way that was never seen before. The place for this revolution was the internet. Also known as the World Wide Web, governments of the industrial world were not welcome and had no sovereignty. In fact, early Nazians had written a Declaration of Independence for the Internet called the Barlow's Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace. And with this declaration, essentially a new country was formed. A country belonging to no one, therefore belonging to everyone. This Declaration of Independence imagined the Internet as a free space free from governments, much in the same way Africa was imagined by Europeans at the beginning of the scramble in the 19th century. Then, as now, this freedom invited the creation of rules, and the first one to set the rules won the game. Then, as now, the rules were being set by companies. The digital imperialists, like their traditional ancestors, saw themselves fit to decree the laws of the land. And Google was the first of the lot. Every time we use the Google ecosystem, that means Google Search, Gmail, Google Apps or Android, we sign a contract with Google. A contract designed for us not to understand, but one we are nevertheless expected to agree to. 
This contract states that in exchange for our data and the billions of dollars on profit to be made, we, the user, get convenience, freedom, efficiency, connectivity, basically everything. Sound familiar? Like the contracts that gave empires huge tracts of land, lucrative trade concessions, and the rights of governance in exchange for cloth, mirrors, and guns, these contracts are now the laws that regulate the internet. The laws of our phones and computers, the laws of our everyday interactions. They tell us what we can and can't do what we sh can share and with whom, how we should talk, and what the price is for all of this. These laws are so powerful that world leaders are bound by them to a greater degree than the laws of their own land. But did we understand all of this when we signed on the dotted line? Well, did our forefathers? In both instances, the answer is no. Worse still, the answer is no by design. Then, as now, contracts were designed to give the digital imperialists everything and to give us nothing. These contracts were designed to enshrine the first and third rules of digital imperialism. That everything can be data and that data exists for the taking. We all sign agreements to this effect. Agreements that allow digital companies like Samsung, Facebook, Google, Jumia, and Uber to extract your data. Do you ever take the time to read the terms of service agreements that you are required to assent to in order to access this convenience? The convenience of the internet? Or the end user license agreements or EULAs? Do you ever read those? Do you ever read every privacy policy that you agree to for every app on all your devices and for all your devices? Be honest, this is a safe space. I won't tell anyone because I don't do it either. Why don't we read them? Because they are long, complicated, and boring. And this is by design. In 2008, two Carnegie Mellon professors calculated that a reasonable reading of all the privacy policies that one encounters in a year would require 76 full workdays at a national opportunity cost of $781 billion. In Kenya, this would cost our economy $2 billion. And I don't know about you, but this is because these contracts are deliberately long and complex. In a 2019 op-ed for the New York Times, Kevin Littman Navarro analyzed the length and readability of privacy policies from nearly 150 popular websites and apps. He then tested how easy it was to understand each policy based on sentence length and vocabulary. What he found was unsurprising. A majority of policies are deliberately long and difficult to read. Because the contracts are complex by design, we are almost intimidated into clicking accept just to make the big scary legal document go away. And it doesn't help that the join now or sign up buttons are big and shiny, while the links to the agreements are so tiny. The prominence of these buttons suggests that our consent does not matter, but our acquiescence or our acceptance of these terms do. It lets these companies extract our data with our permission. For example, in 2016, a new social network came onto the scene. Known as Namedrop, Namedrop promised to revolutionize professional networking, and hundreds of college students tapped the big green join button. But did they read the terms of service? Nope. Should they have? Oh, yes. Because according to paragraph 2, subparagraph 3, sub subparagraph 1, they all agreed to give name drop their future first born children. The same thing happened two years earlier, where in exchange for free Wi Fi, six people agreed to give their first born children for all eternity to the company providing this service. Did they read the terms of service? Nope. Should they have? That depends on how much you love your firstborn. That's right. A total of 549 people agreed to give up their firstborn children as a means of payment. Now, thankfully, both instances occurred as part of a study by academics. 
These studies confirm what everyone already knows, that first nobody reads online contracts, license agreements, terms of service, privacy policies and other agreements. And that second, these agreements are a perfect way to get us to agree to anything. Remember, the terms of the agreement do not matter, but our acceptance of them does. Because we as users are provided with the chance to say no, our acceptance of these agreements is nearly absolute. Acceptance is the name of the game, and sometimes this acceptance doesn't even require action on our part. Some websites, by virtue of your use, collect and track your data. Let me explain this another way. When the colonizers wanted to take our land, they signed treaties with the chiefs, clan leaders and kings of the various African tribes and kingdoms. These agreements also written in a language foreign to the accepting party and with the terms not fully explained, provided the pretext for the subsequent conquest and plunder. These treaties were designed to favor colonial interests and were, as a result, necessarily indecipherable or un understandable to the local population. They were not written for the imperial subjects to understand. They were written for the imperialists to use. This means that then, as now, the agreements, treaties, contracts, whatever, provide the imperial framework that justifies later extraction, conquest, and plunder. Today, the internet has spread far and created a parallel society that mirrors the one we live in. The imperialists have created rules and established practices that reinforce their conquering of the digital world. And each of us holds multiple citizenships for every agreement we sign. For Android users, we are automatically citizens of Google. For WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook users, we are automatically citizens of Meta. For Jumia users, we are automatically citizens of Jumia. And on and on it goes. By 2025, there will be 76 billion digital devices in the world. That is almost eight devices per man, woman, and child. These devices will become so commonplace that more people will have access to them than clean water, electricity, or a bank account. Now, if each internet user has 90 accounts on average, that is 90 citizenships and legal obligations across eight digital devices per person in the world. That means that each person signing an agreement they are not meant to understand has given up a resource that is far too valuable. Each person agreeing to a new world order with a simple click of a mouse or tap of a button. The scary part is that this control is extending outside the internet into the real world. In 2012, Facebook ran a study without the user's knowledge, of course. This study manipulated the news feeds of 700,000 users. Some saw more happy things than usual, while others saw more sad things or things that made them angry. The study found that by manipulating this, the news feeds, Facebook could influence the content their users posted to Facebook. More negative news feeds led to more negative status messages, as more positive news feeds led to more positive statuses. As far as the study was concerned, this revealed that emotional states can be transferred to others by emotional contagion, leading people to experience the same emotions without their awareness. It touts that this emotional contagion can be achieved without direct interaction between people. However, this is not the most interesting thing. The study also found that when the news feeds did not provoke an emotional response, people used Facebook less in general. What does this mean for Facebook? Seeing as they make more money whenever we use the app, to get more money, Facebook needs us to use the app more. And to get us to use the app more, maybe they manipulate each of our feeds, getting us to behave the way they want us to behave. And by the way, it's not just Facebook. All the digital imperialists put things in front of you that will get you to click. If those things happen to elicit an emotional response either way, so be it as long as you are using the platform, service, or device, and you allow them to do this, remember? At the time, and even now, Facebook was allowed to do that. Remember those terms of service you signed when you signed up? And I quote, Facebook users relinquish the use of their data for data analysis, testing, and research.
end quote. Put simply, Facebook owns our data, the data we give them, the data that comes from our cravings for chicken at 3 a.m. in the morning, the data from every selfie, every tweet, every random search. The data that represents our lives and personalities doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the imperialists. The agreements we signed create a digital world in which we do not own our own data, but our data still exists for the taking. Even as we discuss more regulations to give us more control over our data, these regulations continue to presume that we don't own our data. They oblige the imperialists to provide us with the right to say, stop, I don't want to give you my data anymore which is not the same as the right to say, yes, I want you to take my data. Which is to say that the agreements they drafted and we signed set the status quo for the internet. In the same way that the imperialists changed the status quo for our land. They changed the way we understood land, resources, and ownership. Likewise, the contracts we sign have fundamentally changed the way we understand data and data ownership. These agreements, which we do not read and are expected to not read, have created a world order that works to our detriment, all with a simple click of a button or tap on the screen. An imperial world order shaped in their image that sees our lives exploited and dispossessed for their profit. A whole new world, indeed, for them and for us. Thank you for watching. Thank you.